I'm going to talk about roadside drug detection today, and this, most of my life lately has been revolving around spit. And I don't think you can get much lower than that, but it really is kind of interesting, and it's very challenging in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is, is the, the first of two projects that were done on oral fluid screening in, in Canada, and Darcy Smith, who worked with me on this, is with the RCMP. He's a toxicologist whose lab was closed and now works with the, the Drug Evaluation and Classification Program. And also, his life revolves around spit. So just to give you a little bit of background, <clears throat> the, the use of drugs by drivers has really become a, a hot issue in Canada as well as around the world. And that has escalated immensely over the last little while with the government's decision to legalize recreational cannabis in this country. And a lot of that concern has to deal with the use of cannabis by drivers. The number one problem that we are going to see associated with cannabis in the short term anyway deals with drivers using cannabis. And the one thing that you come to realize very quickly when you start to, to look at cannabis and driving is we all want to look at the alcohol model. I mean, we've been reasonably successful. It's taken a long time to get to the point where we are in terms of alcohol and driving. Cannabis adds a measure of complexity that just is incredible with the challenges that, that it, it brings with us. So what really is the problem that we were looking to, to address here? Well, again, when you look at the alcohol model, we have approved screening devices that police can use at roadside to determine what a driver's uh, blood alcohol level is in a relative way, which is tied to impairment. And we know that. We would like a similar device available that we could use for drugs. Now, the first problem is, no matter what you drink, the key molecule is alcohol. It's one thing. When it comes to drugs, there are hundreds and hundreds of molecules that you're trying to detect. It is virtually impossible to do that. We also want something that's quick, unobtrusive, and accurate. Again, that's a challenge. We want it to tell us whether or not the drug is over some legal limit. Well, we don't have legal limits for drugs. We're working on one for cannabis, and even then we're going to have some challenges with that. Every drug would have to have their own legal limit. That's going to take a long time to do, and I doubt we'll ever get there. The key point, however, is if we're going to use some kind of roadside testing device for drugs, it's got to provide us with reasonable and probable grounds for arrest. That is, to be able to arrest the driver, take them downtown for further testing, be it a blood test or be it um, evaluation by a DRE. <clears throat> So when we look at the kinds of tests that we could possibly use, we have several options. I keep saying that the one that's not on the list is probably the best one, and that's brain tissue. <laughs> it would solve the problem. Uh, the idea of having a, a police officer at the side of the road take a sample of brain tissue would just absolutely provide a terrific deterrent. Blood testing at the side of the road is, is probably not a good option either. Although in the US roadside surveys, they do it. They ask drivers to voluntarily provide a sample of blood to go along with the oral fluid sample that, that they have provided. They pay them well to do that, and I don't think we're about to pay drivers here to provide a sample of blood for evidential purposes. Another fluid that is readily available is urine. The province of Quebec, a number of years ago, did a roadside survey where they asked drivers to provide a sample of urine to test for drugs. Interesting procedure. Uh, it requires special facilities to, to do that, uh, and I don't think we're going to go down that road either. Besides, with urine, you're looking at drug metabolites, not active drugs, so that's probably not the best thing anyway. Breath, we use breath for alcohol. Uh, there's some companies out there that are looking at breath testing devices for cannabis uh, using uh, 
very sophisticated technology. I haven't seen one yet. Uh, I hear there are some trials going on, but I haven't seen one yet. And they are likely to be relatively expensive and we just, it would only test for cannabis at this point. Uh, sweat, there's new technology out there that uses sweat from your fingerprint or from the tip of your finger. It can also take your fingerprint, which is a whole other uh, issue, but very interesting technology that could come online pretty soon. So what we have is oral fluid. My favorite, spit. So here's where we started. As a member of the Drugs and Driving Committee, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background about this. Uh, the committee is structured under the, the Canadian Society of Forensic Science, and uh, some of you may know about the Alcohol Test Committee, which has been around for a long time. And the, the Alcohol Test Committee tests alcohol devices to, uh, for approval in Canada. They test the device and recommend to the Attorney General to put them on a list of regulations, and those are the only ones that can be used in, in Canada for legal purposes. The Drugs and Driving Committee has, has been around for quite a while too, uh, but we've recently been asked to look into the idea of oral fluid screening. First of all, what they wanted to know was, do they work? And secondly, how can we possibly use them in Canada? What value would they be? And as one senior police officer said to me, so you want to determine how long it takes a cop to break it? <laughs> yes, essentially. Does it work in the field? The other part of what we were asked to do is once we determine whether or not oral fluid works for detecting drugs at the side of the road, there needs to be standards set. There are standards for alcohol devices. There needs to be standards set for oral fluid screening devices as well. That's a big job. We're getting there. So there's all kinds of drug uh, screening devices out there. Uh, all kinds of different ones that, that can be used. And so what we really had to do was pick a few uh, that, that we could look at easily, that were recommended by some of our colleagues in the, in the US. And we had to find people who had been using drugs. I mean, if we went around this room and, gave, and collected oral fluid from everybody, uh, we might find a few that were positive, but most of them would be negative, and that doesn't tell you a whole lot. What you really want to do is find people who've been using drugs and test them. So what we did was we went down to the uh, certification ses sessions for the drug recognition experts in training, and they bring in people who, have, who are known drug users and, and tested them. So they gave us um, two samples. One was tested on site with one of these devices and the other one was collected and sent to a laboratory for analysis. Now, I mentioned there are hundreds of drugs that can, can be used by people, and these devices do not collect or test for hundreds of different drugs. The ones that we were looking at tested for six categories of drugs. Some of these are categories, not specific drugs. So cannabis, cocaine, which essentially you're looking at the metabolite of, of cocaine because cocaine metabolizes very, very quickly. Amphetamine, methamphetamine, opioids, and benzodiazepines. So there's six categories of drugs that were included in, in these devices. And to make a long story short, what we were able to do is use a bunch of drug negative samples as well and, and use those to determine sensitivity and specificity uh, for the various devices as well as for different drugs. Now, we weren't looking at specific devices. That wasn't the purpose. So we put all the device data together. So they're all collapsed here. They're all very similar in, in terms of their performance characteristics, at least the ones we use. But the first thing to notice is that uh, there, there are two categories here that really didn't come out all that well. One is amphetamine and there are a variety of different reasons, reasons for that, where the sensitivity is, is about 0.77, and benzodiazepines, which are really difficult to detect in oral fluid. So those two are automatically off the list. But when it comes to cannabis, which is indicated as THC here, it was pretty good. Uh, cocaine came out pretty well as, as, as well. Methamphetamine and opioids as, came out well as, uh, in these tests as, as well. So 
Uh, overall, the conclusion was that these things are able to detect drugs fairly readily and easily, and with a certain degree of reliability that was acceptable. Uh, there were drugs that did not come out very well and should not be included in any device that gets uh, approved in, in Canada. Uh, the other thing was opioids seemed to come out fairly well, but the devices that we were looking at didn't have all the different opioids on them. There's a lot of cross-reactivity among opioids, and some of the ones that, that are on the devices that they screen for are only available in the U.S., and some of the ones that are available in Canada are not screened for. So we decided that probably that's not a good choice at this point either. Standards. Everybody wants the standards. They're in development. What the standards are supposed to do is provide clear direction to manufacturers as to what would be required for a device to be used in Canada. The process of getting a, an oral fluid screening device approved is very, very complicated. Much more complicated than approving an alcohol test device. And it's going to take a lot of time and money. First of all, to do, to, to do uh, an alcohol screening test uh, through the approval process, basically you can do it in your basement in a few hours. It's very simple. When it comes to screening or testing one of these devices uh, for drugs, it requires a toxicologist with a GCMS in a laboratory for a very long period of time. It's very expensive to do that. That's the kind of process we're looking at. So when you're looking at uh, asking questions about, well, where's the standards? You know, how long is it going to take to get these things out? It's complicated. It's time consuming and it's expensive. So the questions are, who's going to do it? I mean, finding a toxicologist who's willing to do this, who has the time to do this, is one question. And who's going to pay for that is another question. So the real key question, the next key question is, how are we going to use these things? What good are they? Well, first of all, uh, the new legislation, Bill C-46, as some of you may know, we've kind of eliminated that suspicion part for alcohol. Uh, we're not going to go so far as to call it random alcohol testing because it's really not. But we don't need suspicion. An officer will be able to uh, ask a driver for a breath sample without any suspicion at any time at any place. That's not the case for drugs. The officer will still require suspicion of drug use before they can go to the next step. Well. The first step in that process is to make sure that the officers know what they're looking for. Can they detect drug use in drivers just by looking at them or by watching their behavior in, in some way? So they're going to have to have something. Now, there's a program in the States called A-Ride where they teach officers to do that. Not all drugs have the same effects. They're not all as observable as some of the other effects. And they certainly do not look like a person who has had too much alcohol. Once we get a positive screen from a driver, then what do we do? Well, that would give you presumably reasonable and probable grounds to arrest the driver and take them downtown for an evaluation by a drug recognition expert, or, and or, take them directly for a blood test. That all remains to be determined. And the big question at this point is, isn't oral fluid screening positive result sufficient to provide reasonable and probable grounds? That's a legal question. That's not a scientific question. That's a legal question. And we'll just have to wait and see how that comes out. So just to illustrate how the, the different processes work between alcohol and drugs, what I've tried to do is simplify things here. So for alcohol, we start with suspicion. Well, if the new bill gets actually passed, the suspicion part for alcohol will be gone. You won't need it. 
you'll be able to do a, uh, at least a breath test. We're not sure whether it means you can do a, a standardized field sobriety test without, it, again, that's a, that's a legal question. On the basis of that, you can issue a short-term administrative suspension, which is being done more and more across this country. And if you happen to live in British Columbia, not only is there a three-day suspension, they can take your car for three days. That's a whole other talk in and of itself. But from there, you can go to an evidential breath test. When it comes to drugs, you're still going to have to have suspicion. So you've got to be able to determine whether or not the driver is giving you the indicators that drugs may be involved. Then you can go to an SFST, or if we do approve oral fluid screen, screening devices, you can demand an oral fluid sample to be screened at roadside. Now, this gives the provinces the opportunity to parallel the alcohol administrative sanctions for drugs. So we can introduce that new administrative suspension piece there for potentially drug-impaired drivers as well. But the SFST it will be reasonable and probable grounds, but it's not clear whether the oral fluid will provide that or not. And then you take the driver downtown for either a blood test or uh, an examination by a drug recognition expert. So that's potentially how this could fall out so that we get these parallel processes more or less for both alcohol and drug offenses. Couple of points to remember. Oral fluid screening will only screen for a few drugs. We will get THC, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Those are the only three that, that the Drugs and Driving Committee has indicated that, that we can screen for reliably at the side of the road. We still need to be very careful about miss rates and false alarm rates. We don't want to miss too many, but that's not such a big problem. I mean, that's a public safety problem, but the false alarm rate, that is you get a positive result and the person hasn't been using drugs, that's a problem uh, from a legal perspective because we, we're, we end up doing a lot of things to people that aren't necessary. And we need to really look at that carefully. Oral fluid screening, by the way, will not be evidential. It is not sufficient to prove a case of impaired driving. It will not do that. It does not give you a level of drug. It does not indicate impairment. All it does is give you an indication of whether or not the person has consumed a drug in a reasonable period of time prior to driving. We're not looking at metabolites. We're looking at active drug products for the most part. Again, they're not evidential. They're not impairment detectors. They do not in any way remove the need to have a very strong drug evaluation and classification program. For one, you're going to need that kind of evidence to uh, proceed with charges. You're also going to not have any screening for a whole host of other drugs that are not screened for. Any drug that's, that's not screened for, uh, you have to you will have to use a DRE to do that. We will need DREs. I think the most important point is that should we go down the road of oral fluid screening and actually approve these devices for use, they're a tool. They're not the solution to this problem. They're a tool. There are lots of other uses for oral fluid drug screening that are becoming more and more obvious to us, but they might not necessarily in the driving uh, uh, sense, but in other aspects of our lives, such as employment. And that's all I have to say about that.